from the authors of Author Masterminds. This is Mysterious. Mystery surrounds us every day. Join us and listen to true stories of mystery, from human behavior to nature and the physical environment to paranormal experiences. The stories are true, even if we can't explain them. Did Richard Willoughby really photograph a mirage in the sky? Or was he conning the residents of Juneau, Alaska and the many people who paid dearly for a copy of his photograph? Hello, my name is Steve Levi, Alaska historian and the master of the impossible crime. Be sure to stay tuned at the end of this episode for my poem, The Bandersnatch Beast of Taslina Lake. But before we begin, I'm going to have to give you a scientific explanation of a Feta Morgana. Feta Morgana is F-A-T-A space M-O-R-G-A-N-A. A Feta Morgana is an atmospheric conditions where what you see today and what you see in a week may not be the same. As an example, imagine that you are standing outside and looking at some mountains in the distance. On one day, the mountains could be very, very small and obviously very, very far away. And a week later, all of a sudden, the mountains can look massive and substantially miles closer. That is a Feta Morgana, named for Morgan Le Fay, the sister of King Arthur. Richard Willoughby is famous for his Feta Morgana photographs called The City in the Mist. Richard G. Willoughby was hardly what many residents of Juneau during the Alaska Gold Rush would have called a model citizen, even in the 1880s. What he did was absolutely reprehensible, unless, of course, you happen to have an exquisite sense of humor or were an Alaskan. While today he is remembered only as a namesake of a street in Juneau, in his day he was known as the creator and shameless promoter of Alaska's best-known Feta Morgana. Cursed by some and revered by others, there are few who dispute that Richard G. Willoughby added to the charm and folklore of Alaska and its con man history. Though the meaning has changed over the centuries, a Feta Morgana is a mirage of a city where a city is not. That is to say, it is a mirage of a city that may appear over a body of water or in the clouds above a mountain peak. Sometimes it is an unknown city, and at other times it is a city that is recognizable, a city thousands of miles away made visible by an atmospheric condition which cannot be explained by conventional science. The first recorded Feta Morgana was in 1773 and appeared on the Straits of Messina in the Mediterranean. Described by a Dominican friar, Antonio Manassi, this Feta Morgana was so detailed that armies of men on foot and on horseback could be seen in the foreground. Arches and castles were visible in the distance, and on the distant hills, flocks of sheep could be seen grazing peacefully. Though Manasi claimed to have seen the mirage on three separate occasions, history does not record any corroborating witnesses. Interestingly, the term Feta Morgana comes from King Arthur's enchantress sister, Morgan Le Fay. Among her many powers was the ability to make cities appear on rocky shores wherever she willed it. And it was said many a sailor was lured to a watery grave by the promise of a safe haven on the rocky shore of the sea. True Feta Morganas are very rare. They are so rare that many in the scientific community believe them to be frauds. But from a historical perspective, there have been enough sightings that the phenomena has been written up in source books. One such book, The Handbook of Unusual Natural Phenomena, even lists Richard Willoughby's Phantom City. Willoughby called his Feta Morgana the silent city of the Muir Glacier. It was quite a sight. There, hovering above the Muir Glacier, was the mirage of an entire city, complete with flat-topped homes with brick and stone, ships, tall elm trees, and churches with onion-like domes. Willoughby claimed he had first seen the mirage on the morning of June 21, 1885, while prospecting for gold, alone, in the Glacier Bay area. The phantom vision had lasted for about half an hour, he later stated to bemused residents of Juneau, 
and was so clear a photo could have been taken of the apparition. Everyone in Juno had a good laugh, and no one believed him. Over the next few years, Willoughby claimed he saw the city in the mist a number of times. Since he was always alone, though, there was no one to corroborate his tale. Then, as Willoughby aged, he began to see money could be made with his silent city in the mist. Changing his vocation from miner to shill, he moved into the actual city of Juno and began a career of greeting tourists on the Juno docks and signing them up for a tour of Glacier Bay. Not only would they see a mighty glacier, he said, but they just might see the most amazing sights in the world, a city hovering in midair. As Willoughby stated, once in Glacier Bay, the tourists weren't going to see any puny, pusillanimous gobs of ice that Europe calls a glacier. No, he assured them, they would not just see glaciers calving into the sea along the two-mile front. If they arrived at the right time, they may see suspended in the sky above the glacier the mirage of a great unknown city, steeple churches, business blocks, trees waving into walled parks. Uh, those who claimed to have seen the mirage were given a certificate by Willoughby, which, quote, costs but a drink of whiskey, witnesses related. His tours were successful. A well-educated man who was described by his contemporaries as both elegant and sophisticated, Willoughby made his living selling an image of Alaska as a land where anything was possible. His tours were usually packed, and he went along as Professor Willoughby and built his talks as scientific lectures. Though not many tourists ever saw the silent city, its fame, along with that of Willoughby, spread far and wide. Then Willoughby developed a more ingenious way to fleece the tourists. He claimed to have purchased a camera and a number of highly sensitized plates from San Francisco and announced plans to photograph this mysterious city in the mist. He set out for the glacier to wait for the conditions to be just right. Then, on June 21st, 1888, according to Willoughby, he spotted the city again hovering above the Muir Glacier. Taking his time, he took a photograph of this elusive Feta Morgana. When the plates were developed, they revealed a ghostly city just as Willoughby had predicted. The photographs were an instant hit. They were also a financial gold mine. During the tourist season, the photos sold out frequently, with many people standing in line to buy copies. Many tourists bought them by the dozens for friends and relatives in the lower 48. As more and more photos sold, the fame of the silent city grew so fast it was often said in Juno and quite probably true that the silent city of Muir Glacier was the most well-known Alaskan city in the rest of the world. At first, the residents of Juneau scoffed at the photographs. No one could possibly believe that there really was a city in the sky, they thought. But they thought wrong. The city in the mist attracted people from around the world. Finally, as more and more tourists flooded into Juneau, many of them bent on seeing this phantom city, the merchants began to realize a profit could be made on these travelers. Here was a gold mine that required no mules or tunnels. Juno's tourism industry was booming. Clothing stores, general stores, grocery stores, and hardware stores expanded to supply the expeditions to the Muir Glacier. Boat traffic north to the Muir Glacier was heavy. Not to be left out by the rush he had engendered, Willoughby enhanced his own fortune by selling copies of his photographs for 50 cents a piece. That's about $75 today. Let me take a short break. I've written several books on the Alaska Gold Rush. Let me tell you about one you would find interesting. The Human Face of the Alaska Gold Rush. Far too often scholarly books just give you an overview of the events and some of the people that were involved in the era. But The Human Face of the Alaska Gold Rush is an on the street and in the saloons look at the Alaska Gold Rush, including the interesting people who were there and the interesting events that happened. And if you wanted one more good reason to be reading anything on the Alaska Gold Rush, punch up the Alaska Gold Rush on the internet. What you will find is the Klondike. And the Klondike is not the Alaska Gold Rush. It takes place in the Yukon Territory of Canada in Dawson. The Alaska Gold Rush is a 40-year era, which begins in 1880 and ends at the First World War. 
And my book, The Human Face of the Alaska Gold Rush, talks about some of the interesting characters that took place in the three major communities of the Alaska Gold Rush, Juneau, Fairbanks, and Nome. As expected, the scientific community eventually felt compelled to examine the photographs. One photographic expert, Dr. Charles Gilbert, who happened to be in Juneau, took it upon himself to look over the evidence. He examined Willoughby's plates and found them to be ordinary. He reported that when Willoughby was asked about his photographic developing techniques, Willoughby was very vague and very evasive. The exposure for the city had to be very long, Willoughby claimed, so there had to be a corresponding adjustment to the developing process. Once the plates were exposed, they had to be soaked for at least three months in a secret compound. Interestingly, Willoughby explained the exposure process was done in sunlight rather than a dark room. Gilbert was later paraphrased in Popular Science Monthly in 1896 that Willoughby's lack of understanding of the function of a dark room led him to conclude that the photograph was a fake. When he examined the original negative, Gilbert found it to be very old, stained, and a faded plate, apparently a negative which should have been discarded because it was underexposed. As the photographs were distributed to ever larger numbers of people, the authenticity of its subject matter was tested. Sooner or later, someone was going to recognize the city. And that's exactly what happened. Dr. William H. Hudson of Stanford University looked at the photograph and instantly recognized the silent city as Bristol, England. Also paraphrased in Popular Science Magazine, he was able to identify the spot from which the photograph was actually taken, Brandon Hill, which was above the town. Noting the scaffolding around the tower in the foreground, he was even able to state conclusively that the photographs had been taken at least 20 years earlier. If these revelations did nothing to stem the interest in the silent city, if anything, the identification of the city seemed to enhance the Mirage's reputation. Neither the tourist traffic nor the sales of the photograph diminished. Eventually, the truth was revealed, maybe. About 10 years after watching tourists buy photos, a disgruntled Junoite and one who was probably not partaking of the profits of the miraculous city leaked the story that Willoughby had once paid a stranded English photographer $10 for the wanderer's camera and photographic plates. The photograph of the silent city was actually a photograph of Bristol that had been overexposed and was thrown away by the original photographer. Instantly, the citizens of Juno divided into three groups. There were those who felt that the silent city was truly in the mist and Willoughby had been able to photograph Bristol courtesy of some bizarre atmospheric aberration. Then there were those who felt it was a fraud cooked up by Willoughby to feather his own nest. There were also a number of Junoites who felt the culprit in this case was the wayward English photographer who had left the exposed plate in the camera to fool Willoughby into believing he had actually photographed the city. The arguing was fierce and bitter. But the arguing did not affect Willoughby in the least. It did not seem to affect the tourist trade either. <clears throat> this final revelation, like those before, did absolutely nothing to stem the tide of interest in the silent city. Travers still came from around the world Juno. The tours to the Muir Glacier continued and Willoughby had no difficulty drawing large crowds and selling great numbers of his photographs at the now inflated price of 75 cents a copy. Interest in the Fata Morgana did not abate until Willoughby sold the negative of the silent city to, quote, a well-known San Francisco photographer, I.W. Tabor, for $500. That's $18,000 in today's money. Thus did another piece of Alaskan folklore pass from the pages of history. While Willoughby was possibly only interested in making money, what he probably did not know was his silent city scam would become one of the first tidbits of Alaska's heritage of absurding. Since tourists coming north wanted to believe the most outlandish tales about Alaska, some Alaskans have not been above creating improbable myths and legends to satisfy the most fertile of tourist imaginations. The concept of a city in the mist was so unbelievable, it could only be found in Alaska. And that's what tourists wanted to believe. Richard G. Willoughby provided them with that myth. As the tourists stared into the mist above the Muir Glacier, Willoughby laughed all the way to the bank. 
After Willoughby sold his celebrated negative, he left Juno and went back to prospecting. He died in 1902, and whatever the truth was about the photograph of the silent city above the Muir Glacier, Willoughby took to his grave. Now, stay tuned for the Bandersnatch Beast of Tazlina Lake. It was Alfred St. Clair and his twin brother Jake who had captured the monster of Tazlina Lake or at least so they said, in the Ugruk Saloon as the last of October brought on the gloom. Cotton Cash Creek as the winter closed in, the two men were up to their eyeballs in gin. They'd been buying on credit from Eskimo Sam, who demanded they balance their debt with gold sand. The twin brothers were caught between fire and pan, with no credit and no choice but to pull off a scam. Now, I'm telling you, Sam, swore Alfred St. Clair, that sure as there's taxes, we're on the square. We'll pay off our credit soon's we get the cash from selling the furs we've got hid in our cash. Eskimo Sam, not born just that day, said only one word, and that word was pay. Now, listen here, Sam, said Jake in a fit. It ain't that we're broke. No, not one bit. It's just that we're short this particular week. Just wait a few days for the gold dust you seek. So be a good sport and pass the whiskey, eh? Eskimo Sam still insisted they pay. It was suddenly clear to Alfred and Jake that their days of freeloading here were at stake. So Alfred began with his forked silver tongue to sweet talk the owner out of his whiskey and rum. For a week, maybe less, till their fortunes would change, Eskimo Sam had but one word to say, pay. Then Alfred said, Sam, I've a confession to make, but Jake here and I have one hell of a stake in a bona fide bit of a traveling show that we've got out in a cave hidden by snow. It's the Bandersnatch Monster of Tazlina Lake, and I swear to you, a fortune we'll make. Alfred spun such a tale he believed it himself, in spite of the fact he was baiting with stealth the most marvelous scheme he'd ever engaged, as long as it was most carefully staged. I swear that it's true, he whispered to Sam, that this Bandersnatch creature is not just a scam. He's nasty and mean, stands seven feet tall, can strip a man to the bone when it chooses to maul. His legs are as thick as can and spring, and his fingers and toes are fashioned to cling. Now Jake was not dumb, and as Alfred spoke, he jumped into the fray and added his smoke. That bandersnatch demon from Tazlina Lake's been chopping down miners like Chichacos eat steak. He'll rip out your liver with razor-sharp claws and feast on your gizzard, bloody and raw. He's a devil, I swear it, said Alfred in fear, and he's chained in a cave not that far from here. We was planning on showing him down Seward Way. But seeing you want us to balance and pay, may we make a suggestion to bring us all riches? Put cash in your till and coins in our riches? Eskimo Sam, at the thought of gold coins, thrust out his hands thus to enjoin those extended by Alfred St. Clair, and the men struck a deal to become millionaires. Jake would imprison the beast with timbers and chains. Alfred St. Clair would proceed to arrange for a show of the monster to miners with cash, gold dust, nuggets, or furs from their cash. There would be only one showing, Alfred proclaimed, for the Bandersnatch beast was quite far from tamed. For a week and two days, Alfred remained, reinforcing the timbers and back window frames. The miners were told the Bandersnatch tales of the terror and blood and gore it entailed. In legend and lore from the dawning of time, it walked on two legs and was covered with slime. When it dropped to four legs, it was quick as a fox. It could rip gaping holes in a trapper's food box. It was ruthless in anger, could bite you in half, and ravaged all men who dared cross its path. Day after day, as nighttime grew longer, the tales of the Bandersnatch horror grew stronger, 
till miners and trappers and traders and wives were chilled to the bone with bandersnatch lies. But still they were drawn to hear more of the tales that shivered their spines and left faces pale. Finally it came, the monster's premiere, and the Bandersnatch monster would finally appear. The beast was caged in the Ugruk saloon, where it was chained to the timbers like a golden spittoon. Jake, with a shotgun and twin 44s, stood over the beast while it bellowed and roared. From the Ugruk saloon down Main Street, the miners and traders who'd come to Cash Creek drank up their courage in the Ugruk saloon for this terror of shows to open quite soon. By the day of the show, Cash Creek was packed with those eager to view the vile bandersnatch. Alfred St. Clair with a cash box of tin charging ten bucks to each who came in, to the miners and trappers who trembled and quaked at the thought of the monster of Taslina Lake. Jake still remained with the bandersnatch beast, and the roar of the monster stalled everyone's speech. Just as the last of the miners came in, and the last of their money was locked in the tin, Jake suddenly streaked from across the saloon, his clothes all a shred, and his voice to the moon yelling, He's loose! He's loose! My God, he's mean as a snake, this bandersnatch monster of Taslina Lake! Run for your lives! He shouted once more, and the crowd in a panic rose from the floor, flinging the windows and the doors open wide in a valiant attempt to salvage their hides. The doorway was packed and the windows were crammed as panic-struck miners continued to scram. They chose any crack that allowed a retreat to escape the sharp claws of the bandersnatch beast, till the only one left was Eskimo Sam, who chuckled and juggled gold nuggets in hand. For in the excitement with fear in the air, Jake and his brother, Alfred St. Clair, casually sauntered out of the Ugruk saloon and mounted two horses whistling a tune. And that was the last of Alfred and Jake and the Bandersnatch Monster of Taslina Lake. Thank you for listening. Mysterious is sponsored by Author Masterminds and the Readers and Writers Book Club. You will find links to the book club and the Author Mastermind store, as well as to my books. Thank you for listening, and we'll be back soon for another episode of Mysterious.